Welcome to the Father's Day. I'm Jesse Lee Peterson. I want to know, is it possible to have inner peace? My guest today is Lama Jitme Gyatso. Pretty close, right? Pretty close. Uh, <laughs> and he called himself a liberal, controversial Buddhist monk, healer, and meditation teacher. That's Thank you job. so much for being with You're me. You're totally welcome. I have so many questions for you. My first question is, why do you wear those clothes rather than normal clothes? As a Buddhist teacher, wearing this uniform makes me more available to those who are looking oh, I see. for help. One time I was on public transportation, we had a pullover, some poor fellow was having a seizure. I, while we were waiting for the paramedics to come, I was able to make my way through the crowd, let me through, you know, I'm a priest, and lay hands on him and soothe him a, a little bit. And everyone was very comfortable with that. It also alerts the haters, and, you know, <laughs> which is less than fun. There's been times when I've meditated on the corner of a busy intersection, you know, when people are on their way to work and they get to see something positive, you know. And I've had cops pull me over. And this uniform helped a great deal. Mm. Okay. My audience will want to know why you're sitting on a box and not on a chair. Okay, yeah. several reasons. One, as someone, who, as a professional contemplative, who on a good day uh, meditates and chants six to eight hours a day, this is how I spend my life. Oh, okay. And so I'm just much more comfortable and resourceful in this position. Also, with my arthritis and my injuries, this is the way I'm, once, once again, most resourceful in the sitting position. Did you bring the box? This is your box. Your, your staff cobbled it together. <laughs> I know. And by the way, Thank you, cobblers. Why the candles? <laughs> because your staff felt it would really be pretty. <laughs> Do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? There's a veritable smorgasbord of ideas. I have a problem with very few of them. But I just don't believe in belief. You don't believe in belief? And when I say what I, what, what I mean by that, is this. Belief can be a contrivance of both intellect and emotion. And by contrivance, I mean a rigidity. I want to feel a certain thing about a certain thing, or I want to view a certain thing in a certain way. Right. Um, Lao Tzu draws a simile, a comparison between the dead branch of a tree and a cadaver. And he says, um, Dead branches and cadavers are rigid, whereas um, saplings and infants are pliant. When we become rigid in our heart or in our mind, we become, metaphorically, disciples of death. And so, a part of my training is to shy away from the idea of absolutes and belief and be to to allow myself to be more oriented towards the idea of, oh, I can, that's a useful idea, or at this moment that doesn't feel like a useful idea, perhaps someday it will seem like a useful idea. And so to have a very gentle, fluid, malleable approach. Uh, are we as human beings in a fallen state? Well, that would, de that would depend very much upon one's definition of fallen. Would you please share your definition with me? Um, a fallen away from God. Okay. There... Funny thing about emotions is they're like a bus. Every 20 minutes, another one comes along. Right. And so there are times when we can feel very connected with the divine. There are times when we can feel very alienated from the divine. How about you? Are you in a fallen state? With God? Yes. I'm really not, I don't really think in those terms. Um, and I want to be sensitive to you. My understanding is that you're approaching spirituality from a Christian point of view. But don't be sensitive to me. <laughs> Um, would you say it's a fundamentalist uh, p Christian point of view or more of a liberal Christian point of view? Uh, me? Yes. I'm very conservative. Okay. So, one of the passages I love in the New Testament is in 1 John where we read, and I paraphrase, let the Spirit do its work. 
or do his work. And in Tibetan Buddhism, the idea of being led by the spirit or being guided by the Dharmakaya is very common. In fact, there's a tapestry of a man with unruly hair like mine going like this, and he's listening to the whisperings. There was a time earlier in my life when I would, just, would have described myself as a complete slave to fear and rage. And at that time, I didn't know how to tune in. So are you saying you're not in a fallen state? See, once again... Can you give me a yes or no? I'm, I know I'm you black and I'm slow. No, don't no, be silly. I just found out that you're Jewish. Yes. So you are a Jew who is a liberal, controver controversial Buddhist monk. How did that happen to you? Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. When I was a kid, I had the mixed blessing of having a rather tragic familial experience. Um, lots of physical abuse, lots of, just about every type of abuse. So I was a pretty miserable kid, but with anger and fear and sorrow just beat me up. And so I was always looking for magic. Um, and I would view spirituality as practical magic. And I explored different facets of Judaism, different facets of Christianity, different facets of New Ageism, different facets of Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and the like. I, I knew I was a miserable kid. I didn't want to be a miserable kid. And so I was always searching for something. Right. And as silly as it sounds, as a small, as a, uh, I guess a 12 year old, I saw Star Wars in 1977. And I, that was the first time I was exposed to the idea of holy man is hero. Because in popular culture, they're often viewed as uh, charlatans or fools or cowards. Who put you through so much pain? What cost it well, as a youth? That's, that's tough to say. Um, my late mother uh, was troubled. My stepfather, my late stepfather, very troubled. What was your father, your natural father? My stepfather was overbearing and domineering and demeaning. And he intimidated my birth father. Really? And um, that's all I know. I don't know much about it. My birth father passed on before I got a chance to actually meet him. So all I had was hearsay from my late mother. You teach um, meditation, right? I you do. are a meditation teacher. Um, what type of meditation do you teach? I teach primarily from Buddha's larger meditation manual in, the, in Pali. It's known as the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. It doesn't require faith. It doesn't involve mysticism. It doesn't involve um, magic. So it's let me ask It's very that. straightforward. So you wake up in the morning, you go into your meditation room, and then you do what? Schedule permitting, I begin by chanting about 30 minutes worth of the Tao Te Ching. And Can you give me an example of that? Um, A small example? Well, I could chant some for you if you wish. Right, that's what I mean. Okay, Leah. I've got it on my trusty iPhone because it's easy to carry one phone and 15 books. Oh, okay. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, you realize a mystery. Caught in desire, you see only the manifestations. Yet mystery and manifestations arise from the same source. This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness, the gateway to all understanding. Darkness within darkness, the gateway to all understanding. Isn't that simply spooky sounding? It does. So, 
<laughs> so, so this is what you're saying all the time while sitting, or no? It's oh. what I would call that a preparatory practice. I would oh. do that for a half hour, right. and then I spend about 60 minutes doing a formal meditation. Oh, okay. So, what good does it do you to meditate like this? Right. The liberation that's promised in the scriptures that I work with is not necessarily liberation from unpleasant things, but a liberation from the tyranny of unpleasant things. So let's face it, any chump can be happy when everything goes his way. What separates the men from the boys is the ability to cope and be fluid and even joyful and peaceful when you don't get what you want. So are you a, does it make you a stronger man? Do you like Clint Eastwood? Yes. Remember the movie Heartbreak Ridge? Yes. He kept, what's that phrase he kept saying? I can't remember. Improvise, adapt, oh, yeah. overcome. And that's what he felt a, a real man was, or at least a real Marine. Right. I found that my contemplative practice contributes to my ability to improvise, adapt, and overcome, you know, and also be loving and peaceful and joyful. Are you a man? I'd like to think so. And what is a man? A man feels the same spectrum of human, the full spectrum of human emotions, but he's, he's not a slave to them. And he's able, in the midst of his, his experience, he maintains a modicum of self-control, a modicum of compassion, and a, mod a modicum of insight. Do you feel like a man or a woman? Um, that's a good question. I wouldn't know. In this lifetime, I've only been a man. So I have no frame of reference of what it feels like to be a woman. Although, I suspect it's harder to be a woman than a man just because men, such as myself, can be idiots. Are women smarter than men? Some, some subjectively, to me, it definitely feels that way at times. In what way? I'd say that when men experience genius, it tends to be for one or two specific things, or three at the most. I found that women's genius is spread over more things at more times. And um, my lineage is tantric. One of my, so my lineage is tantric, and so I have a tantric partner. I personally benefit greatly from being in partnership with a woman. I really feel that our gifts uh, complement each other and that we make an excellent team. I'm currently in a fantastic relationship where we each have our own strengths and our weaknesses, and we support each other. Are so. you married? No, I am not. Uh, when you say partnership, are you like living with a person? Are you living I with a am. man or a woman? I'm living with a lovely lady. Is that the right thing to do? I believe it is. And why? Well, I, she, I mean, to use the believe word. So here's uh -huh. the thing. Uh-huh, you said you believe. Yes. And er early you said you didn't believe. I didn't believe in the word Now believe. you're confusing me. I know, I'm just terrible that way. <laughs> There have been many lamas who um, dress just like me and taught just like me and also practice tantric arts with a partner. So I'm very progressive, I'm very, very liberal. <laughs> and one of the things, one of the patterns I see and other many other progressives see is the dichotomy between patriarchy and matriarchy. Many years ago, when we lived in a primarily agra uh, agrarian society, you know, in a Bronze Age civilization. You've been married before? Of shepherds, where you may own a land or you may own goats, you know, women were treated very much, very much like property. And for my, um, where I'm at in my personal evolution, I want to shy, uh, shy away from that as much as possible, the idea of possession of a person. So have you been married before? I have been married before. How many times? One. And did you feel, feel as though you own a goat? <laughs> own a goat? <laughs> I've, I, I, that simply falls apart, I've never owned a goat. <laughs> but um, did you feel as though you owned your ex-wife? What I felt was, when she wanted to part ways, when she wanted to leave me, she couldn't leave me when she wanted to 
because she had to jump through so many hoops of, through the, the legal system. I see. So your first wife left you. That is correct. Why? That's tough to say. We tell each other. What does she tell you? We, we tell each other things that often, for reasons that make us look good or feel good, but those are seldom accurate. Not necessarily from deceit, just often from lack of self-knowledge. I think because I, I think of time, you know, what did she tell you? Why she said, "I'm leaving you, Mr. Buddha," because <laughs> she, you know, she expected of me to build a career as a hypnotherapist. I chose instead to pursue a career as a meditation teacher. Over, over the years of the marriage, as I learned how to gently and respectfully assert myself and say, no, I don't think so. You gave her that expectation, though, when you met her and married, that this is the life you're going to have, but you changed along the way? Personal growth was profoundly important to me. And anyone who's ever dated me gets that, that, they, right. that I'm, I really want to evolve. Do you have children? I don't. Oh, good. I read that you, uh, you say that you're bisexual too? Uh, yes, it, but I'm not a very good bisexual. Not a very good one? No, I prefer women. But you mess around with men and women? In the past, I, explore, I experimented with that. So in the past, you had sex with men? And, and do you have sex with men now? No. Nope. Why not? There was a time when I was exploring, um, seeking relationships, and I, I dated men, and I dated women. And it, there's a phrase I, I think I shared with your assistant or your producer, sapiosexual. Yeah, what is that? That's falling in love with someone's mind. It's falling in love with someone's heart. And I guess falling in love with their body thirdly, but that's not the first thing. I like a good mind, <laughs> and I like a good heart. Do you have sex with the mind? Metaphorically. Really? Metaphorically, a good conversation is very intimate. So would you feel that way about men and women if they, you, felt, fought in love, you fell in love with their mind? Well, I, my crystal ball is in the shop. In the past, I felt that That's way about mean. men and women. Right. But here's the thing. Part of the thing about being a man as opposed to being an adolescent or being a child is we can feel what we feel without necessarily acting on what we feel. Let's face it, the penitentiaries are full of men who couldn't control their behavior. Right. They, they felt an impulse and then they acted on it and then bad things happened. The number of people we can feel attraction for is far greater than the number of people we can actually have a relationship with. Right. And the number of people we can have a relationship with, potentially, is far greater than the number of people we can be in a relationship with at that moment. And we can be like a grizzly bear at a stream you know, eating one fish and then seeing another fish and reaching for that while the other fish, his first fish is falling out of his mouth and constantly reach, right. reaching for the next fish, you know, the next object of desire. Or we can be with our partner and be centered and be lucid and cognizant and devoted. So let me ask, when you were having sex with men, did the women know that you were having sex with men? Did you tell the ladies? Yeah, I'm an open book. You say, hey, I, I mess around with men, and, and would they have a problem with that? I found in the past that when telling a prospective love interest of my bisexual tendencies or proclivities, there was three categories of responses. One was disgust, one was feeling threatened, and one was feeling really excited. <laughs> I, in the past, I dated two women who were like super enthusiastic to um, have a bisexual threesome with me. Really? Um, they, they weren't at the same time. It, right. it didn't work out. I never, I'm not really wired for casual sex. I'm really, well, I seem to be wired for a relationship. Um, did you ever have like a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a man? For sure, I, I tried to. Really? Uh, so are you a homosexual? Um, I would describe myself as a man who's explored his bisexual tendencies. 
And he's currently in, currently in love with, in, involved in a heterosexual relationship. What would happen if that desire for a man came up while being in a relationship now? Would you leave the woman and go be with the man? That's an excellent question. And the answer is, you can be in a relationship with a woman and see another woman and you develop a crush on her and yet choose strategically to do nothing about that crush. Right. You know, we don't have to be led like a bull by the ring in its nose. Right. Let me ask, when the last time you had sex with someone's mind? Someone. Someone's mind or intellect. So I see, I don't really think of it that way. Do you use a condom for that? <laughs> I'm joking. Let me ask. No, no, I, no, I would say, I would say, I was having um, the other day, my partner and I were having a conversation about the election, and I was feeling very vulnerable, very upset. I was very invested in the election. And she said something that was, I felt was so wise and so insightful. And it just multiplied the affection and love and intimacy and respect that I had for her. And yes, at the time we were fully clothed and we were at opposite ends of the kitchen and just conversing. But intimacy, I feel intimacy can be physical and it can be emotional and it can be intellectual, sometimes all at the same time, sometimes serially. When you felt that way, did you go like, even though she didn't know it was happening, did you go like all the way? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um. You said that you're very vulnerable. That's something that a woman would say. Do your woman know that you are a vulnerable man? I think anyone who converses with me for more than 30 seconds can tell I'm vulnerable. But, but isn't that a so, weakness but, though? I mean, see, here's especially for thing. a man? There is a, there is, that's a great question. There is a certain disorder uh, whose name eludes me at the moment. It's a medical disorder where people are physically incapable of feeling physical pain. If I, if I can quote Hillary Clinton, our God-given pain receptors serve a marvelous function to keep us alive. Our emotional pain receptors are also useful. They are not an error from the divine. They really benefit us. Any type of pain we can, we can experience, whether it be mental or physical, can serve us, has the potential to be of benefit. Their anthropologists will say that there's always been a minority born with senses super perceptive, very perceptive. And they would typically, way back in the days of yore, live in the outskirts of the village, and they would act as an early warning system because their, their sense of smell and sound I know, but being vulnerable so is a weakness, and you normally hear women say, they, oh, they're so vulnerable. A man is strength, and wow. he's there for his vulnerable woman. That, if you are feeling a, that way, aren't you feeling like a woman? Well, once again, not a, I haven't been a woman in this life, so I wouldn't know, but in the West, we've been, we've been sold a dichotomy. Little boys are raised, you know, you know little bo men, big boys don't cry. And um, we're, we're told, to, because of the gender we're born with, we have to feel a certain way. But they're not raised to be that way. That's natural for boys. It's in their nature well, to be that, strong. That is the and it's in the nature of a female to be a female. But here's the thing, let's go back. This is super important. There's a dichotomy. Regardless of religion, in every religion, the same dichotomy exists. And that is between fundamentalism and liberalism. And one of the tenets of the unspoken common denominators of fundamentalism is control. And by plopping individuals, into cubby holes, metaphorically speaking, that can serve as a means of controlling them. Did you vote for Trump, Hillary, or? I voted for Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party. And why? As I felt that the platform that she espoused was in greatest harmony with my worldview. Okay. Why not Hillary? I did not feel that she was in harmony with my worldview. And same thing for Trump. I wish him, I wish our president-elect the best of health, 
and every blessing of love and wisdom that's available, but he was not my choice. But you gotta admit, when you woke up Wednesday morning and discovered that Donald Trump was president, there was a sense of joy. I disagree. You For you, there might have. For me, there was not. Let me ask, uh, Black Lives Matter, you heard of them? I have heard of them. And would you agree with me that they're an evil, radical, <laughs> agitated? Not at all. Do you see them as a good group? Well, I'm not an expert, but I would say this. Statistics have shown that there is systemic racism in our country. And the likelihood in a given scenario, whether it's being pulled over by a cop or whatever the scenario is, statistically, Black Americans or African Americans are in greater danger of receiving violence from the police than their white counterpart. Not true. At being a Jew, when I see uh, the historian's account in, in newsreels and in lectures of the atrocities that were committed against my people in Germany and in Austria, I'm horrified. When I, I, I read about you, what we, happened to my people in Russia and in Spain and in Portugal and in Rome during the Inquisitions, it was horrible. And when I see what happens to black Americans at the hands of the police with very little, if any, accountability, it's horrific. But you see it in illusion. I want to ask a you this. A uh, rabbi once said, let me say this never thing. again is not just for the Jews, it's for all beings. Well, let me say this to you. Um, Black Lives Matter is lying to you. Blacks are suffering due to the destruction of the family and the lack of moral character. It has nothing to do with racism. Racism doesn't even exist. That's a made up word, it's a lie. Mm. Uh, so, my, and, and uh, it's made up to control black people by keeping them angry at the white man and then to intimidate white people in order to get power and wealth. There's no such thing as racism. Blacks are suffering well, due to lack of moral character. How are you going to prove there's no such thing as racism? How it's, are you going to prove that, Nick? It's because if you look at it, it's easy to prove that there's no- By the no, way, I'm having trouble supporting my back right now because right, of the yeah, I'm going like now. this right now, yeah, not because that. I'm trying to be aggressive, but because I'm trying not to fall over. So this is what I want to ask. Since you believe this lie is it possible that everything else you believe is wrong? As a white-ish, because a lot of people don't consider Jews white, but as a white-ish guy, I've seen, I've seen cops treat me than other folk differently. Because you followed the orders of the cop. You didn't give them a rough time. You were not a criminal. You didn't have a record, right? No record. You had your driver's license and car insurance, right? But the thing is, uh -huh. from my own so experience... So is it possible that all this other, these other things that you believe, could that be a lie? Because you truly believed into a lie about racism and white cop with black. Right, so that's a is great question. Is it possible question? that everything yeah. else you could believe it, be yes, believing see, this is the wrong. fourth time you've asked me that question. And I'd love answer? to answer it. Let me, let me hear you answer real fast. The answer is... There's a vast difference between a possibility and a probability. And intellectual integrity requires that we keep an open mind to every possibility. And in fact, in the hard sciences, we were told that ceramic was an insulator. And then in the 80s, we learned that not only is it a conductor, it's a superconductor. So you're going to find out one day you're wrong about a whole bunch of other things. Why did you leave? Did you, did you desert being a Jew? There, or Judaism? So did you here, like desert that? Well, yes. It depends who you ask. No matter you, did you. Right, so here's how I would answer that. Of the non-Asian meditation teachers tooling around on the earth right now, the most prolific are Jews. So if you ask, you know, what makes a man a Jew? Does wearing a yarmulke and a tefillin make someone a Jew? Or does make, is a Jew a racial thing, you know, because I have a big nose and an affinity for bagels? 
or is it is or what makes a man a Jew? Is it is being a child of Abraham me being vulnerable to the Holy Spirit? What made you a Jew when you were a Jew? Being vulnerable to whether you call it Dharmakaya or Holy Spirit or Tao, being vulnerable to that. In fact, if I remember correctly, um, in the New Testament, we are told that the church is the bride of Christ. And we must be vulnerable to the urgings of the Holy Spirit. And who is God? That doesn't really enter into my metaphysics. Really? And do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I know you that don't believe. That does not enter into my metaphysics. Oh, okay. So do, 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 how about do, good and evil? Do, is there good and evil? Where humility embraces vulnerability, hubris embraces defensiveness. And one of the ways we um, fix the blame outside ourselves is by blaming it on an etheric entity or a celestial being or a fallen celestial being. So you don't believe in good and evil? I, it, it isn't that I believe in or believe in it. It's just that I've got my hands full working on me. And I can see we live in an interdependent universe and there are outside influences. Everything affects everything, but... But because you're not answering my question, I don't understand what you're saying. You're a smart guy. I think you need to give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Let me ask this. Uh, you have back pain right now, right? I do. Why, and you're a healer. I do. Why don't you heal yourself? Well, that's an excellent question. And here's, and here's my, and I will, like a Jew, I will answer your question with a question. How many thoracic surgeons do you know who perform their own bypass? But I don't know, but why don't you well, heal? You can't heal yourself, but you can heal others? Sometimes. But not yourself? Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Oh, I see, but not other back pain. A wise man can recognize his limitations without being threatened by them. Did you have fun? It's been very invigorating. <laughs> <laughs> you want some Tylenol? No thanks, Tylenol makes me cranky. Oy vey. Screaming ladies come for the church. I wish and wish it's a never game through.